entering the waiting room, I was escorted to a furbished uh, storage room. During the walk, the guard provided a rundown of activity in the jail over the past 24 hours. One day, it could be about inmates arguing over television channels. Another day, it was the antics of an intoxicated inmate. Today, it was quiet. The guard was relieved. When we reached the room, he unlocked the door with a loud clack that was not unlike the sound of an MRI machine. In response, my body flinched. I entered, sat on a thin plastic chair, and waited for the guard to secure the door. Clack! My body recoiled and tightened up again. I was now secured. As I marked time, I looked around the room. The architecture was dedicated to dullness and monotony. Picture ceiling tile you've seen in government buildings, doctor offices and hardware stores. One fluorescent light worked tirelessly to illumine the space. Truthfully, it hurt my eyes. All four walls were cinder block and painted institutional gray. Stale air filled my lungs. On the opposing wall was a red emergency button. Once an inmate accidentally bumped his head against it during a fit of laughter. In less than 10 seconds, four armed guards swarmed the storage room. And although I argued it was an accident, the guards' faces said they thought otherwise. I often felt claustrophobic in this room and immediately started practicing deep breathing to ward off an anxiety attack. Within minutes, I heard the faint sounds of sandals swishing across hard floor as the men walked down the hallway. Eight inmates in orange shirts and pants arriving for meditation. Clack! A guard unlocked the door and the men filed in. As they adjusted their chairs, the sound of plastic rubbing against uh, the tile echoed off the cold walls. When the sound ceased and the men settled, the guards surveyed the room once more. Clack! The door was secured for the final time. All that was left were inmates and me, sitting horseshoe style in silence. I began by welcoming each man and thanking him for attending. They could have stayed in bed. In fact, several who were present the previous week slept through today's class. We began with movement. On flimsy plastic chairs, we slowly stretched toward our knees and shins as we coordinated movement and breath. Continuing with our breath, we imitated a seated cat-cow yoga flow. Gently, we guided our shins to the right shoulder and then to the left. With hands on our hips, we gently twisted our torsos to the left and right, like squeezing out a wash rag. As we completed our practice, our final stretch was lifting the corners of our mouth up. You could do that one if you'd like. Quiet laughter popcorned into the room. Since entering the jail, this, 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 this was the first moment I took a complete breath feeling my belly, jaw, and shoulders soften. It was time for seated meditation. The men embodied a posture which integrated two qualities, attention and relaxation. Eyes could be open or closed. Once the men found the seated position or once the posture found them, a stillness steadily cradled the room. I talked briefly about boat anchors. Lake Michigan was only a few miles away. It provided a local touch point. 
Anchors offer stability, I told them, particularly when the water is rough or when the winds roar. Our anchors today were the body, the breath, and sound. Each man was invited to choose one of those three anchors. When the mind wandered, the instructions were to simply notice the interruption and without making it a big deal, return to their anchor. This was the practice. For the next 15 minutes, we observed how the distracted mind easily slipped into the future and past. We observed different feeling states and sensations in the body. No matter what we observed, we practiced being aware in those unmoored moments with kindness, judgment, and compassion. Instead of being harsh, critical, or running away from our experiences, we practice benevolence and affection toward ourselves as we returned again and again to our anchor and present moment experience. After 15 minutes of mindfulness meditation, the men were invited to rest. Thus, after the work of meditation, the instruction was take a break, relax, picture kindergarten children lying on mats or a blanket, a time just to be, non-doing. However, instead of a comfortable mat or blanket, we found a respite on cheap plastic chairs. Somehow, somehow, somehow we made it work. After five minutes of resting, we returned to our converted storage closet the small circle of men reflected on the day's practice. For many, it was the first time they had experienced peace in jail. They were surprised it was possible to be relaxed here. For others, it became an interval to reflect on their life. Many professed a desire to better themselves, and for some, being still, even for short moments, was extremely uncomfortable. We spent time normalizing this experience and offering techniques for working with this discomfort. Next, I handed one of the men a book, My Grandfather's Blessings by Rachel Naomi Remen. I loved this book and found its stories compelling and heartfelt. I thought the men might feel the same way. So I brought Remen's book with me one week and asked if they would be interested in listening to a story. They agreed. Her stories were so popular that they asked me to bring the book to every class. We developed a routine. Each week, a different inmate randomly thrip, flipped through the pages until he was moved to stop. Wherever his thumb paused was the reading for that day. Sometimes the inmate read. Sometimes they ask me to read. Sometimes they pick someone else in the circle. Anticipation breathed through the room as the reader began. Wonder what's coming at us today, someone whispered. After the reading, we often marveled at how the story was exactly, exactly what was needed in that moment. There were stories of strength and love and healing and the simple pleasures of life. We were amazed at how familiar the stories of a physician with Crohn's disease on the West Coast felt. They connected us to her, to each other, and to life itself. We came to realize that we shared similar aspirations. We had similar dreams and hopes. We wanted to matter, to love, and be loved. We wanted to laugh and feel peace and contentment. We wanted safety and health and freedom. For the remainder of our time, we asked questions. What do you think she meant by that? We debated. Do you think it's better to be safe or loved? Or are they the same thing? Many of the readings elicited stories from our own lives. 
One inmate wiped tears away from his eyes as he shared how his 10-year-old nephew wrote him every week. Many times after a story was read, a lingering silence fell on the group, the weight of it penetrating our hearts and minds and imaginations, touching something deep and indescribable. We never, never, never wanted our time to end. We longed for just one more story. Clack! My pulse again sprinting through my veins, my breath quickening. A guard opened the door. It was time to go. Ninety minutes was over. The men stood and shuffled into the hallway, lining up for inspection. On one occasion, while the inmates were being inspected, and I was walking toward the main entrance, a man looked around, smiled, and gave all of us a final benediction. Hey, everyone, don't forget, be a good story today. At first, I didn't understand. Something about what he said bypassed my brain and went straight into my body. I just remember smiling. What did he mean? What did he mean? When I reflected, the inmate was invoking us to live fully and deeply to live with purpose and wonder, a sense of humor, just like the story in Rachel Naomi Remen's book. He was imploring us to live with kindness and an open heart, looking beyond appearances and deficits, to live into our aspirations. To be a good story meant asking questions, staying curious, speaking, being our truth. It's a way of saying, be the best version of yourself. To bless the world and those around you. No matter if you're a mindfulness instructor, no matter whether you're a guard, no matter an inmate in secure detention. A bit quiet now. I didn't start by introducing myself. Have you, some of you may have wondered like, why is he not introducing himself? And isn't it interesting that you may have had that thought, but you found yourself caught up in the story and forgot. Maybe some of you still remembered that. Like, why didn't he introduce himself? And for me, this is the power of stories and how the stories that we tell um, can be influential. This book uh, for me that I wrote, which by the way, uh, all of the books that um, are sold today are going to the Sojourner Family Peace Center. Uh, so if you are inclined in any way, uh, all of the proceeds will be uh, going to this organization, which I believe um, your church uh, supports. Um, so just a, a little blurb. Gold coins are accepted um, and firstborn children as well. So, um, so this idea that stories, stories matter. Um, I have also become interested um, in doing some of, looking at some of the research and data around stories and storytelling. And no surprise, um, there has been remarkable studies on how stories and how we tell our stories can make an uh, impact on our sense of agency or purpose. It can have uh, an impact, um, not only of that, but believe it or not, it can affect our biology. There's a particular study, it's randomized, that looks at these things called telomeres. And telomeres are the caps on your chromosomes. 
If you've got good telomeres, it sort of suggests uh, longer aging, um, a bit of a protection against chronic disease. And stories can have an impact on our telomeres. So there is, uh, again, some of this aspect of story that's actually grounded in science and research. When I wrote this book, part of what, uh, in addition to the story of the inmate, which I'll, again, invite you to ask questions in a, a bit. Uh, but one of the things that occurred to me that I began noticing and observing was that whenever you hear a story, often you um, hear a story within yourself. Somebody tells a story and you go, oh yeah, that reminds me when my uncle or aunt or grand it often has this effect. And so um, what I would like to offer, and this is purely optional, is you've heard my story. And so the invitation is for maybe the next 10 minutes, you're sitting at a table with other human beings and maybe you might join a table. Uh, but the invitation, if you choose, if with the people around your table, uh, if there is a story if you have a story that you would like to tell, um, I'd like to invite you to do that. And it could be anything. It could be what you had for breakfast this morning. It could be something that you saw yesterday at the grocery store. It could be a conversation that you had at the post office. Uh, the idea is that we all have stories and that our stories really do matter. It's a way that we connect with each other. It's a way that we're known. It's a way that we uh, can understand others. I once had this dream, um, and I have to tell you, I wrote this down. I once had this dream where one of the characters in my dream said, let us forget enough of ourselves. Let us forget enough of ourselves to see more clearly. And I believe that stories give us this potential to, um, to forget enough about ourselves, maybe, to see more clearly. So, 10 minutes, um, enjoy a little storytelling, and then we'll come back and see what happens.
Okay, you have a, just a couple minutes. If you're telling a story, just a couple minutes. Okay, just to invite you to finish up. And, and uh, as you're finishing up, just to consider that what you are doing um, has been happening for thousands and thousands of years, just like this. So part of uh, maybe some of what captured some of my interest in stories goes back um, I in some ways there are many ways but it goes back to my kindergarten teacher Doris Cravens and one of the things that Doris Cravens did was instead of reading stories to us she invited us to share stories to our classmates and for some reason, um, I was always the one to volunteer. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Imagine that. That is, <laughs> that is. It. And one of the stories I love to tell is I love to tell stories about my cat, Smokey. I had a cat that could play pool. I have yet to meet another. And, and so anyway, I would to tell stories about my cat, Smokey, who uh, played pool. And I remember um, at a certain point, uh, there was parent-teacher conference, and I remember Doris Craven saying to my mom, your son loves to tell stories about his cat, but this thing about playing pool, that really is kind of a different level. And and uh, I remember my mom saying, it's really true. <laughs> my cat would jump on this little miniature pool table and with its paw, actually paw the billiard ball into the pockets. And, um, and that's how that, that happened. As I grew up, uh, the other thing I became very interested in, I grew up in West Central Illinois, and, and maybe the best way of giving you a visual is picture Illinois, the state, and you know where it's pregnant? And right at the belly button, that's where I grew up. And uh, one of the things that um, I really enjoyed in the small town of 500 people was I often would carry my cassette tape to what we called th then old timers. And I loved hearing their stories. I loved hearing stories of uh, World War II veterans, truck drivers, I love their accents, uh, and I, I just loved how they saw the world. I uh, remember one particular story how during the Depression, um, one of them to make money actually uh, got on a train uh, in the Midwest and rode the train out to Washington State. I remember this person saying, it was so cold in those boxcars. Uh, but he said, I went out there because I heard I could make money uh, picking peaches. And that's what they did. So uh, part of my background is marriage and family counseling. And in that arena, you know, that is sort of the main work is stories. You listen to all kinds of stories. And part of what you uh, listen for is stories that help heal. Uh, 
um, stories that help um, one to maybe work on forgiveness or uh, um, maybe walking closer toward their aspirations. I was very interested there were, uh, and for a while Milwaukee had a bit of this, uh, but it originally uh, came out of Australia and New Zealand. There was a book called uh, Narrative Means to Therapeutic End, so you kind of see the arc of that. It was very much rooted in stories, and the particular therapy was very much about looking at stories in our lives, and particularly what we would call uh, exceptions in the story. Where are the exceptions in the story where it didn't go sort of in a more negative way, and what can we learn from those stories? So the idea is that we all have stories, just what you are sharing, and we all have stories that potentially can uh, help us to move forward, to move um, on with our lives in different ways. A little bit about me, um, but I'd like to come back to you. I'd love to hear a couple things, so um, would love to hear if you have any questions about uh, the book or the writing of the book, uh, or just any questions. I'd love to hear uh, if you have any reflections or thoughts uh, about what you noticed when you were sharing stories at the table. Uh, what did you notice? Uh, was this like extremely uncomfortable? Was it fun? Did you remember things that maybe you had forgotten uh, that came back to you? Uh, did you find yourself connecting or finding maybe connections that you didn't know existed uh, before you sat down at the table? So I would love to hear from you. Chris, did you have the inmates start telling their stories as part of that process? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, did I have them tell their stories? And one of the things uh, that happened in the sharing of particularly the stories that we would read always at the end of our time, so we would read the story, and often that is the time where they would share stories from their life. So it, it kind of gets at what we did here. Often when you hear a story from someone else, you think of stories in your life. And the little bit that I read always stuck out to me. There was one particular inmate um, that some might describe as hardened. Um, and this might be way too much detail, but this is an inmate that I'll never forget came to one of the meditation classes who had actually pulled a fingernail off of his finger. I mean, that is something that, and, but he's the one, he's the one that when he, uh, he had really forgotten some of this, but he was the one that would receive a letter from his 10-year-old uh, nephew every week, and he cried like a baby. Um, when he said that. And I could tell, everyone could tell, he was a bit embarrassed about doing that in this group and in this particular setting. But all of them were, you know, were extremely supportive of him. So the answer is, yeah, yeah, they did. A lot of them did. A lot of them talked about things that many of them struggled with substance um, use. Um, a lot of them struggled uh, with difficult relationships, and so some of that would come up. Um, and in that part of our work, uh, really, th I felt they really became supportive of one another. But it gets at this idea is that stories can allow us to tell things about ourselves that we may not always um, be able to share. Stories give us permission to share these domains in our life that maybe um, it, it may be more difficult when you're buying groceries or when you're, you know, when you're out in life. Uh, stories can give us this... Um, ability to share these pieces of ourselves that are very important. So, great question. Someone else, yes, over here. In a, um, a neighborhood youth group with needy kids in Saginaw, Michigan, there were some teenage volunteers and one woman was a, one young girl was an East Indian girl and she and the kids had trouble settling down and we couldn't figure out how to make that happen and she said we're taught how to 
to be mindful and and to be at peace in kindergarten. You know, they have so many, many people, and maybe their trouble is different, but that was taught to them from the, the get-go, and I just, just it, we started doing that, and I can't really, I didn't remember how, how good it worked, but I could feel my shoulders relaxed as you were talking. So thank you. One of the things that gave me the idea of, of bringing mindfulness to the county jail, which is a story in itself, was I began seeing kind of this um, circular flow. I often, part of most of my work was working with those persons and families that one, either didn't have mental health insurance or access to mental health, or uh, were involved in the court system in some way. And I saw kind of this circle of some of the families I worked with, um, again, some of them going into our county jail and then coming out. And so I thought, wouldn't it, doesn't it make sense that while at least some of them are in our county jail, rather than just simply to sit and watch TV or other things, wouldn't it make sense to maybe potentially offer skills that might be helpful, uh, kind of like what you're saying. And so I had this idea, uh, which I thought was really a great idea for our community. And I remember writing the email, you know, like great ideas, right? And so it was like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> and so I, I would do this like every six months and write the same email. And like about two and a half years, I got a call one day. Chris, could you come over to the county jail? I understand that you have an interest. And I, of course, dropped everything and said, okay, let's go. So sometimes you know that's how it works. You knock at the door, knock at the door, and then um, at some point uh, you get that call. And then when you get the call, uh, you do it, right? So. What other thoughts or questions? Complaints. I love complaints. I don't get near enough of them. So, Chris, one of the things that I um, realized as we were <coughs> having to trade our stories around the table is um, that as you tell a story, as you construct a story, you just the way that you, or I don't quite know how to phrase it, but you find meaning in events by just like the act of telling the story, like something that may be, may, maybe because you have to put it in a narrative. Um, so I, I don't know if you have anything to say about that and maybe how that works in therapy or, or both in the, any, any context, do you, do you find that having people tell their stories kind of helps them make meaning out of certain events? Yeah, uh, thank you, Seth. So there's this super cool study uh, that um, does just that it's, it, uh, I'll tell you two of them that I find very fascinating. The first is um, actually for persons that choose to go to therapy. And in this study, what they did was that they asked the patients um, to write their narrative uh, before a session, and then they would write the narrative after the session. And one of the things that came out in this study that I thought was quite remarkable was that um, the study and the writing of it um, creates this sense of agency. That in a sense, when you write a story, you gain a certain amount of mastery over whatever it, uh, story or experience that you're having. And that that sense of mastery actually uh, began showing in behaviors specific behaviors, even before the, the therapy. So again, the act of just telling the story uh, can really begin to have um, really substantial impact on one's behavior. Um, and, and that to me is quite remarkable. Um, the other study that, um, that really caught my attention is um, a study that was done with caregivers of children who have autism. So this is a, um, caregivers obviously have uh, an incredible uh, responsibility and, and just the care of children uh, with moderate to severe autism. 
And one of the things that they did in the study is, a, you know, comparing, uh, again, those who tell their stories and how they tell their stories versus those who don't. And those who uh, really told their story and really thought about how they wanted to tell their story um, showed much higher levels of ease, higher levels of well-being than those who did not. So again, it really speaks to the value of, you know, really storytelling. But I have a question for you. Yeah, I, I would love to hear you, Seth, say something about, because you um, have been uh, in this work uh, for, I'm guessing, a few years. And I'm guessing that you've told a few stories. And that, isn't it true that, um, like, the Gospels and uh, I mean are rooted in stories and and parables uh, and I would just love to hear from your perspective from sort of the theological or uh, the experience of being a rector here is what have you noticed about stories that you've told or heard or seen or even your theological perspective I'd love to hear sort of what you've what you know where, where you have landed with some of that yeah, well, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, just, I mean, just in a very brief way, theologically, I think it is really fascinating um, as a preacher how often if you're given four gospel or four lessons from the Bible, I think most preachers are most drawn to, to preach on a lesson that has some kind of story um, because whether that's a story that happened in real life, real time, or whether that's a parable, um, there's, a, there's sort of an openness to stories, a way that interpretation can ha happen, or meaning can be at multiple levels. Um, stories are so uh, incredibly rich. So like one parable that Jesus tells, especially for us preachers who have to come back like every three years sometimes and find something new in the same short, small story, um, I remember when I was first thinking about doing this ministry, I thought that's it's just impossible. Like I don't know how they do that, but but if you if you're you you can I think you can mine these short stories for all kinds of meaning, and I I think that does spill over to like our stories that like any given event in our lives, there's a richness and a depth and uh, all kinds of meaning that's packed into that. Um, and I think some of what happens in my office is just sort of listening and, and kind of reflecting back maybe some of the richness and the depth that I hear um, when people are giving me like a little piece of their story. So I, I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but um, thanks. Yeah. Well, I'd like to piggyback on what Seth said. Uh, all of us here in this room really feel blessed to have Father Seth as our rector here. And um, the first contact most of us have had with Father Seth is uh, having breakfast, breakfast with him or coffee with him uh, and his encouraging us to tell our story. Uh, you know every Sunday he says, you know, I'd be interested in meeting you with you and having coffee with you and telling your story. And I think two things happen, um, and this is one of the reasons Seth is a great pastor, is we are flattered that he wants to hear our story, makes us feel good, makes us feel welcome, and then he hears our story and he gets to know us. And I think one of the great uh, reasons Seth is such an uh, excellent uh, pastor and uh, is gifted in pastoral counseling is that he's emphasized storytelling as an important part of his ministry. I hope, <clears throat> I hope this is about me, whatever you're going to say. <laughs> It's not about you. I'm going to share it. <laughs> I know. I know you. You needed more ego stroking. Um, 
I had an experience of telling my story that I was very, very reluctant, in fact, pretty much refused to do, and then was coached and coached, and slowly I started writing my story. Um, and the person that did that is here, Anna Flock Arcello, right over here. She is actually a writing coach. I recommend her highly. I told her, no, I do not want to do my own story. I do not want to do my own biography. It's not interesting. She said, OK, well, just write this poem. I did. Well, now extrapolate a little bit. I did. And eventually, there's this narrative. And I could share it with my family. So Anna is incredibly gifted. And I just encourage all of you, if you're thinking about this, or you're thinking, I'd like to write my story, but I have no idea how that's going to happen, she's a really good person to work with. Well, that's perfect for me to piggyback on, because I forgot that about you, Anna. And um, that is really valuable. What I had to say is, in light of us being a church community, um, years and years ago, and it was not this church, I had the great fortune of participating in a Linton study program, and I can't remember the name of it, but I think it was something like Salt and Light, and I don't even know if that's a thing, and whether, is that a book, maybe? I can't remember. But we Episcopalians aren't very good at telling our story if you call it a testimonial. That's sort of scary. <laughs> And so in the beginning, the leaders of the group said, in the end, you're going to write your testimonial. And m my hand started sweating, and it sweated for the four weeks of Lent that we did this study. But with gentle guidance, we learned how to tell our story. And so at the end, we indeed were challenged to tell our story and, in essence, write our testimonial, which I still refuse to call my testimonial. <laughs> But it was so valuable in helping me learn how my faith started, grew, was continuing to grow, and still is growing because I'm such a baby Christian most of the time, I think. But I think in a church group, it's especially important to learn your story in light of your faith journey and to be able to tell it is really valuable and a huge contribution. Maybe you could help us learn to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Very yeah, which goes to say that the church itself has a story, and I've been involved with it, writing it, but it needs to, it needs to be updated, I would add. But I personally am also as the oldest, much the oldest person in my family, I'm making a great effort to keep the stories, write them, and so forth for the generations to come. Mm. So true, so true. Um, I am a pediatrician, and in my former institution, I worked, had the good fortune to work with someone very much like Anna, a writer, who was involved in medical education in terms of um, both helping medical students tell their stories for the purpose of their own wellness and well-being, but also um, how we listen to the patient's story um, and how what biases we bring, what our, how much patience we have to let them tell the story. Uh, and really getting us to work on, um, us as physicians on that side of the narrative to allow for openness and honesty. And that was, it's a really powerful and special way that's not really part of maybe classical medical teaching, but um, very grateful to the, um, to her name was Kate, Desh or is Kate DeSherry. And so, and I think Anna, you may do some of that type of work as well or interested because the listening part of the story is also very important. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm actually in conversation with a group called the Health um, Collaborative, Health Story Collaborative, which was started by a physician. Um, and it really is about that very thing that you're talking about. And I do a lot of consulting work in the VA, and um, which you may familiar with some of the work that they do in stories. And 
particularly with patients, they actually put their stories into their medical charts so that they're not just numbers, um, but there is the story of the person. And um, so I really appreciate that and the work that you are doing. One of the things that the, um, I work with an editor uh, and one of the things that the editor often would say when I would come to these points in the book, like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I can do this, you know, or, and uh, she would always say, uh, just, just ask the book, just ask the book what, what it would like. been able to give it to uh, different charities. So most of the royalties have gone to Habitat, uh, have went to a foundation for that supports children with hemophilia. Uh, it went to the UW Center for Mindfulness. Um, and so um, this is to me, when you create a story, when you write your story, it reaches and ripples. Believe it or not, this, this, this is what really floored me. Uh, during the summer, uh, a dear friend of mine was out in Quantico. Quantico is where they train um, FBI. I do a lot of work with police uh, as well. And um, they have the tier one police. And my friend was teaching uh, to this particular branch of the police force. And he said, Chris, you're not going to believe this, but my co-teacher came, and she always brings about 10 books to share as resources. And he said, your book was one of them. Uh, and so you never know the ripples of your story and how they reach people and places that you, know, you, would, you would never, uh, ever, ever expect. So those of you that are writing, those of you that... Uh, are thinking about writing. Um, there's your person, just so you know. Um, and uh, we're going to give you lots of business here. Um, um, how important it is and how it reaches and blesses so many people and encourages them in so many ways that you would have no idea, no idea of knowing. I had a dear friend um, who wrote me a long uh, text message and he said, after reading your book, he says, I've been married to my wife for 30 years, and I think I finally now understand her. Uh, and I thought he was joking, but he was serious. And I was so surprised, but so happy for him that he saw something uh, that enabled him to kind of maybe see his wife in a different way. Um, so I'd like to end um, it's always good to uh, end a little before, I think. Uh, you know, it makes usually people happy. Uh, so, uh, but one of the stories that I have near the end of the book uh, goes something like this. And maybe you uh, have something similar. But um, for me, at least, when I'm alone or maybe driving in the car, I sometimes have conversations, sometimes with myself. But if it really gets challenging, I uh, have in my mind's eye uh, what I would call all of my ancestors. Uh, so I think of my grandparents, my great-grandparents, you know, the larger family. And I, uh, in my mind, have this conversation with them. And at one particular point, I was driving someplace, and I said, okay, ancestors, time to show up. I, I need to ask you, uh, so I need some direction. I need, I need your help. And uh, I today forget what I was asking, but I remember uh, the response. The response came almost immediately, uh, which I was a little bit uh, taken back by. Uh, but this is the response that they said that I'd like to share with you. Uh, they said to me, uh, whatever you do, whatever you do, do with great joy. Whatever you do, do with great joy. And so that uh, is... Uh, what I like to share and offer for you. 
And uh, thank you for your great kindness, uh, for showing up, for sharing the, the precious gift of your time. Uh, and um, if there's any way that you would um, choose to contribute to the Sojourner um, Family Peace Center, um, that would be um, that would be wonderful. So thank you very much. Chris, if someone would like a book and they only have a credit card, what should they do? They should see you. And see me? Because I don't know what to do. Oh, okay. <laughs> is it up? Is it like a website that they, they could you know? Okay. Yeah, All right. Well, I don't have any of that. So see me, and we'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yep. And and if they want to take a book and make those arrangements later, uh, I'm very flexible. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The books are uh, $25 is what you, but if you, uh, you want to give less or more, uh, I'll leave that up to you.